All right, well, we are in the book of James tonight, the book of James, and chapter one, and the title of my message is, Why Does God Allow Trials on the Life of the Believer? And this is from our series, What Every Growing Christian Needs to Know. Let's pray together. Father, tonight we don't want to just get information. We want to find hope especially for those that are here and those that are listening and watching who are feeling rather hopeless, who are feeling quite despondent. They feel like they're just in a black hole. They don't know how to get out of it. They don't know why certain events are happening in their life. It makes no sense. Lord, as we go to Scripture, help us to get clarity, help us to get perspective, and help us to be reminded that you are in control of our lives and we don't have to be afraid. You have your purposes and you have your reasons for trials in our life as we will discover in this message. So speak to us as we open your word. We ask this now in Jesus' name, amen. Well, the theme of this series is what every growing Christian needs to know. And as I've said before, these are certain truths that every believer needs to have in play in their life, no matter if they're a brand new Christian or if they've known the Lord for decades. Certain things that you never move beyond, certain things you never outgrow if you want to make progress as a Christian. So let's quickly review what we've seen and then we'll dig into our topic before us. Number one, if you want to be a growing Christian, you must read, study, and love the Word of God. Again, if you want to be a growing Christian, you must read, study, and love God's Word. Joshua 1.8 says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it, and then you'll have good success. The wise man of Psalm 1, the happy man, of him it says, happy is the man that doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of the scornful. His delight is in the law of the Lord or we could just as easily say the word of God and in it does he meditate day and night. Number two, if you wanna be a growing Christian, you need to have a prayer life. The Bible tells us that we are to pray without ceasing for this is the will of God and Jesus Christ concerning you. I mean, it's great to have a time of prayer in your day somewhere, but it's also a great thing to understand that you can pray anywhere, anytime, in any posture. So we need to be in an attitude of prayer. Number three, if you want to be a growing Christian, you must be actively involved in the church. You must be actively involved in the church. You're just not going to make it as a solo Christian. I remember after I became a believer, uh, I wasn't really sure if I wanted to go to church. And I said to a couple of my friends, you know, I think I'm just gonna kind of do this all on my own. It's just like me and God, okay? But I found out pretty quickly that I needed other Christians in my life. And as you mature, you'll find that other Christians need you as well. Listen, you need the church, and the church needs you. And the Bible commands us to go to church, and not just to attend, but to be a functioning part of it. Hebrews 10, 25 says, let's consider one another to stir each other up to love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but rather exhorting and encouraging one another and so much more as we see the day of the Lord approaching. So let's say you're doing all of these things, but you don't see much change in your life. Well, listen, it takes time to grow spiritually. It doesn't happen overnight. If you were to pull up a chair in front of a peach tree and just fold your arms and stare at the peach, and you could sit there for a week and say, there has been no growth whatsoever. But if someone were to come and visit that tree one week and come back a week later or two weeks later, they would notice the growth. Sometimes when you're up close and personal, you don't see it. Sometimes in your own life, you might say, you know, I don't really see that much growth in my life as a follower of Christ. I, I don't really think that I've changed that much, but sometimes the best way to find out if you're growing spiritually is, well, if you're married, ask your spouse. They'll tell you. 
Or even people that are close to you, they'll say, you know what, I've actually seen changes in you. You're not the same person you used to be. But it does take time. And some people grow faster than other people, or so it would seem, but just be patient. It takes time to grow spiritually. But then sometimes when you're doing all the right things, you may come to a moment in your life where you don't feel God's presence like you did at first. Uh, some of the pastors from our church and I were out at lunch uh, just the other day and, and this uh, server has waited on us another t a number of times. She's very nice and we'll chit-chat with her and, and usually just kind of like conversation. And so she brought our meal and then she said, I have a serious question for you guys. We said, yeah. She said, uh, what are the service times of your church? And we said, well, they're 8, 10, and 12 on Sunday. She said, good, because I'm coming to church this Sunday and I'm going to commit my life to Jesus. And I said to her, no, you're not coming to do it Sunday. You're doing it right here, right now. <laughs> and she slapped me across the face. No, she didn't. And I don't do that with just anyone, by the way, but I really felt prompted by the Holy Spirit to do that. I said, you're doing it right here, right now. She says, here? I said, absolutely, right here. Let's pray. I'll lead you in a prayer. And she just bowed her head and prayed and committed her life to Christ. It was so fantastic. And, and after she prayed, she said, I feel better. I feel different. I said, so now come to church Sunday as a newly committed Christian. But that's a wonderful thing that does happen when we, we come to Christ. There often are emotions connected to it. Quick poll, how many of you had kind of an emotional experience when you prayed and asked Jesus to come into your life? Raise your hand up, okay? okay. How many of you did not have an emotional experience? Raise your hand up, that's okay. You, by the way, you're not second class citizens, uh, category number two, because to the point, I had no emotional response when I prayed and asked Christ in my life. And because of that, I concluded it must not have worked for me. But of course, Fortunately, I realized later that it wasn't about my emotions. It was about faith and what the Word of God says and so forth. But, of course, over the months after, I started having wonderful emotional response. And you would come to church and you would feel God's presence in such a tangible way. And I remember that some of the Christians said to me, Now, Greg, be careful. You're going to go through trials. And I said, What? I'm going to go on trial? No, no. You're going to go through trials. What are trials? You're going to go through times of testing where you may not feel the presence of God. And that's what I want to talk about in this message. Why does God allow Christians to go through trials and testings? I mean, it happens to all of us. Things are going along wonderfully and suddenly without warning or so it would seem. One problem after another comes tumbling into our life. Things are looking bleak. And then the clouds just sort of part and the sun shines again and everything's better. Why do we go through those hard times? Why do we go through those emotional lows? Why do we go through those days of difficulty? Why do these things happen to us? Answer, I have no idea. Good night and God bless. No. Well, the Bible has a lot to say about it. And that's what we're going to look at now. James chapter 1. We're going to talk about this for many verses, but this will be our anchor text. We're going to read verses 2 to 4. My brothers, writes James, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the test of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work in you that you may be mature, lacking nothing. Okay, so we wonder, why is this happening? What have I done to deserve such a fate? I have a grandson, Christopher. He's three, year, he's three years old now. You know what his favorite word is? Why? Everything is why with him. Christopher, don't climb up there. Why? Well, because if you climbed up, you could fall. Why? Well, probably because you lost your grip and we don't want that to happen. Why? Well, because we love. Why? He just why. Everything's why. You know, and we realize after a while, there, there's just no answer. Just because I said so. That's all. He, why? And we say the same thing to God. Why? Why is this happening to me? Okay, point number one. If you're taking notes, you might write this down. God allows trials in our lives 
So we will grow up spiritually. You want to be a growing Christian, right? God will allow trials in your life so you will grow up spiritually. The J.B. Phillips translation of verse 4 says, Let this process go on until you become men of mature character. You know, God wants to make sure we're learning the material, right? Now, I remember when I was in school, I hated tests. And the reason I hated tests is I never studied for them. And I wasn't prepared. And there would be those days in class when the teacher would stand up and say, all right, we're going to have a pop quiz today. And, and my stomach would sink and all the geeks and nerds would be like, <laughs> yeah. And the reason the geeks and nerds were so excited was because they were prepared. By the way, we don't call them geeks and nerds anymore. Now we call them boss, right? <laughs> yeah. Think Bill Gates, right? Uh, it used to be kind of a critical thing to say, oh, you're a geek. Now it's a cool thing to be a geek, right? Especially if you're having any kind of computer problem. But uh, those people were prepared, but I never was. And because of that, I failed many a test. Though I did discover that an F can be turned into an A with one line. <laughs> Just make sure you use the same color pen. It's a dead giveaway, right? So, yes, God will allow tests in our life. He rarely announces them ahead of time. He just lays us on it, lays them on us. And effectively the Lord's saying, well, you know, you say you know this material. Let's test you and see how well you are doing. Here's a classic example of this. In John chapter 6, we have a vivid account of a test that Jesus sprung on his disciples. By the way, that particular miracle uh, that we're alluding to, the feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle found in all four Gospels. I find that fascinating. You would think that maybe the resurrection of Lazarus might be in all four Gospels or some of the other dramatic miracles of Christ. No, the only miracle repeated four times is the feeding of the 5,000. You remember that Jesus was speaking, a great multitude gathered, 5,000 plus women and children. So there may have been as many as 10,000. Lunchtime hit and stomachs were growling. I'm telling you, you can send a, set a clock by my stomach. I mean, literally, I'm, I'm getting hungry at 10, 15, 10, 30, and, and then it's 11. I'm thinking, it's almost time, and actually, technically, maybe it is time. And, and I'll say to my wife, it's time for lunch. She'll say, lunch? We just had breakfast. No, we didn't. That was hours ago. Her metabolism is a little different than mine. There are a lot of hungry people out there. So in John 6, we read, Jesus saw this great crowd of people climbing to the hills looking for him. And he turned to Philip and he said, Philip, where can we buy bread to feed all of these people? Listen, he was testing Philip. For he already knew what he was going to do. Philip said, well, it would take a small fortune to feed all of them. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Well, there's a little boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is this with this huge crowd? So Jesus is trying to determine, have his boys learned anything? Had they learned how to trust him yet? Hey, wow, there's a big crowd here. How are we going to feed all of these people? Now, did Jesus know the answer? Of course. He just wanted to know if they knew the answer. The test was really, do you believe God can take care of you even when the odds are not in your favor? Do you believe that God can provide for you? Well, I know he can. You know, I've been a Christian over 40 years, and uh, I, I've always had the Lord come through for me. He's promised to provide all of my needs according to his riches and glory in Jesus Christ. Oh, by the way, he didn't say all of my greeds, but he did say all of my needs. He gives you what you need, doesn't he? But this was a test so he could see if they were learning. And by the way, just because you've learned something doesn't mean you don't need to be retested again, right? Uh, I had to, I got a physical the other day and I had to have everything tested. My hearing was tested. My vision was tested. And you know, they'll do that to see if it's um, going downhill or not. Uh, and you know, I always am hoping I'll do better than the time before. And I'm happy to report that actually there was some improvements. Uh, and I was happy to find out that my cholesterol was low and my blood pressure was down. I used to have higher blood pressure, and I would say to my doctor, the reason my blood pressure is high is I know you're going to take it and say something about it so it goes up when I see you. So you need to, like, sneak up on me and take my blood pressure. You stress me out, doc. 
but um, so we're retested. Oh, you, you've learned it, you've known it, but do you still know it? Here's what the Bible says about these things. Coming back to James 1, let me read on from a more modern translation. Listen to this. When all kinds of trials and temptations crowd into your lives, my brothers, don't treat them as intruders, but friends. I love that translation. Don't treat them as intruders, but friends. Realize they come to test your faith and to produce in you a quality of endurance. Let that process go on until that endurance is fully developed. And you'll find you become men and women of mature character. Men and women of integrity with no weak spots. It's going to make you stronger. It's like going to the gym. How many of you like to go work out at the gym? Okay, good. Not that many of you, just saying, some of you. How many of you don't like to go? You don't like to go. Okay, that's, uh, there's sort of an in-between crowd I'm not seeing here. Okay, so some like to go, some don't like to go. What am I missing? How many of you just don't even think about it and don't go at all? Ah, uh, that's, there they are. That's, that's the missing group I wasn't able to identify. Uh, I'm probably more like you. You know, I, I do go, I hit the gym. I hate it. The whole time I watch the clock. You know, I watch it, just watch, watch. It's almost over. It's om I hate all of it. I could walk away, never work out again, and be happy and just eat hamburgers every day. <laughs> but that's not good for me, you see. And I will go and do these things, not because I enjoy it, but because it will help me. You know, as you get older sometimes, uh, people will say, oh, I'm just so old. I'm just so lethargic. I'm so tired. I guess I'm just getting old. Could be you're getting fat too, but that's another subject. I mean, it's bad enough to be old. Don't be old and fat. I can't stop aging, but I can fight the battle of the bulge somewhat, at least have a passing thought about it. You're looking at me saying, Greg, you're not doing that well. I told you, this is, you know, it's a struggle. I, I have a scale I got recently. It's a digital scale. I'll weigh myself in the morning. I forget that it talks to my email account. And uh, so I put my email in. And it's a wireless thing. And I actually got an email. I'm not making this up. It's like from the name of the scale company. I go, what is this? I opened it. And it was a big, bold headline. It says, time to step up your game, Greg! <laughs> Exclamation mark. I'm like, shut up. You inanimate, insulting object. But you know what? The scale was right. But you see, when, when you work out, when you do weightlifting and uh, cardiovascular things. You know, the objective is to get stronger, not weaker. And in effect, you break down muscle to build muscle up. Trials are like God's gym, where you're broken down to be built up. So I don't like it. You know, I don't like it. But listen to this, you're gonna like the results. Because I have to admit that after I've worked out, I'm pretty happy I did. But I, I make up so many excuses as to why I can't go, oh, I have a sniffle. Oh, you know, whatever. But you discipline yourself. And God uses these trials. Trials take us from the realm of theory to reality so we can start living out our faith in the real world. Trials make us strong. And people need to understand this. Now, when these trials come in our life, we want to hang on to the Lord and learn the lessons he is seeking to teach us. Look at verse 3. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. That's really not the best translation, by the way. Patience. It's come, it comes from a Greek word, epomone. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. If you're a Greek scholar, you can correct me later. I'll get a text from Don Stewart. That wasn't the right pronunciation. I read Greek and you don't, Don Stewart. Um, <laughs> but I think it's epimony. Uh, it's on the screen there, or it should be. I guess it isn't. It's one of those invisible words. Anyway, uh, but the word could better be translated perseverance. The testing of your faith will produce perseverance or steadfastness or staying power. Even another translation translates it as heroic endurance. I like that translation. Here's another translation, spiritual toughness. So the testing of your faith produces spiritual toughness. Heroic 
endurance, staying power. God wants iron to enter your soul. We all know the story of Joseph, that young man who loved the Lord and resisted sexual temptation and lived a life of integrity. We know how he was falsely accused by the wife of Potiphar, an older, attractive woman who was effectively preying on Joseph sexually. As I've said before, she was the original cougar. And uh, one day she had all the servants leave the house and, and had it all set up to just basically pull Joseph down in that bed and, and go for it. And when she grabbed him, he ran like crazy. She screamed and falsely accused him of rape. He was uh, arrested and sent to prison unjustly. And it was while he was in prison that God was preparing him for a greater work that would take place later. In fact, we read an interesting passage, Psalm 105, verse 18. They bruised his feet with fetters. That means they put his feet in stocks. And they also placed his neck in an iron collar. Can you imagine how hard that must have been? An iron collar. But there's an interesting twist on this particular verse that could also be translated this way, as he was laid in iron, iron entered his soul. Isn't that interesting? So as he was in irons, iron entered his soul. You say, what are you talking about? It means that he toughened up. It means that he got steel, nerves of steel. You've heard that expression. He had a, a boldness and a courage and a strength he did not previously have. Frankly, he was a little bit of a pampered young man. Uh, his father favored him, gave him a really cool shirt while the other brothers had to have basic uh, workout clothing, but a special shirt was given to Joseph and he'd kind of, you know, strut around and, hey guys, what's up? You know, and he had his fancy shirt on and, and if anyone wasn't working hard, he'd go back and, and tattle on them, right? And the brothers really began to resent him and that's why they sold him into slavery. Granted, it was an overreaction, but still. Uh, he was a little bit pampered, perhaps spoiled, but man, God changed him from a young pampered boy into a heroic, strong man of God. That's what God wants to do with you. Verse 4, let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. A modern translation puts it this way, so let it grow and don't try to squirm out of your problems for when your patience is in full bloom, you'll be ready for anything strong in character, full and complete. Don't try to dodge it. Don't try to get out of it. I mean, generally, we see a trial coming. I'm out of here, you know? I don't want to go through that. No, remember what James said? Treat these things as, not as intruders, but as friends because God's in control. Everything that we go through life is father filter. I mean, it's either done by God or allowed by God. That's a phrase uh, my friend Randy Alcorn coined, father filter. He knows what you can take. He knows how weak you are or how strong you are. And these things will be adjusted to where you're at in your life at this particular moment but you should count it all joy according to verse 2 when you fall into various trials. By the way, that could be translated many colored, many colored trials. Various trials, many colored trials. In other words, no two trials are always exactly the same. Uh, you're going to go through different variations of them. And notice it doesn't say if you go through trials. It says when you go through trials. You're going to be tested. The question is will you pass or will you fail? So number one, God allows trials so we will grow up spiritually. Here's number two, God allows trials in our lives, and that's true. But even when things look bleak, all things work together for your good and God's glory. Again, even when things look bleak, all things work together for God's glory and your good. God is in control of all circumstances that surround the believer. There really are no accidents. There's just providence. And that's a good thing to remember. The Job story shows us that the devil can do nothing in the life of the believer without the express permission of God. Well, remember the story of when the angels of the Lord went to present themselves before the Lord and 
Satan was among them because Satan is a fallen angel. And God started bragging on Job. You remember God said to the angels, Satan there as well, have you considered my servant Job a perfect and upright man, one that fears God and shuns evil? And, and the devil began to challenge that assertion of the Lord. But we might ask the question, well, why would God allow Satan to hassle us? Because Satan went on to say, you know what? Job fears you because you bless him. Job follows you because you give him a lot of cool stuff. Loose paraphrase there. Job, Job is your servant because of what he gets out of it. But if he had any calamity, if he lost his possessions, if he lost his livelihood, and certainly if he lost his health, he would curse you to your face. And God actually allowed the devil to wreak havoc in Job's life with limitations. You say, but, but why would God do that? If God loves someone, why would he allow it? Even the devil can serve the purposes of God. Now, God will not allow me to be tested above which I am able, but what with the temptation? Give me a way of escape that I may be able to bear it. Simple way to... Sum that up, God won't give me more than I can handle, but God will allow these things, why? Because in a way, the devil can sometimes do God's work. It'll be determined if I'm a wheat or a tear, as Jesus mentioned in his parable. It'll determine if I'm really a believer or not a believer. Trials will only make a believer stronger because they will cling more tightly to Christ. But that same trial may turn a non-believer away because they were never clinging tightly to Christ. So in a way, these trials, these testings, can help determine if you're really a Christian. Man, Job's wife certainly wasn't supportive. After all, the calamity befell him and it broke out in boils and, and he's lost everything. She says to him, why don't you just curse God and die? Really? Job said, you weren't saying that when you were driving the Mercedes. <laughs> so it doesn't appear that she ever believed. I don't know about her at all. But he, he clung to the Lord. But listen, God works these things out for good. Did you read that crazy story in the news about this man that was bitten by a shark? I mean, that's about the worst case scenario. I guess the only thing worse is being eaten and swallowed by a shark. This man was bitten by a shark, but... The article pointed out that the shark saved his life. Did you hear about this? As it turns out, when he was being treated for his shark bite, it was discovered he had a tumor on his kidney, and it was cancer. And apparently, if he had not been bitten, this would not have been disco discovered, and by then it could have been too late. He had the cancer removed and did not receive any radiation or chemotherapy. And this man, whose name is Eugene Finney, said, I'm thankful for the shark attack. He said, the shark saved my life. They wanted to give the shark that bit the man an award, but he texted he was too busy biting other people, <laughs> hoping for a positive outcome. No, but th this is true, except that part I just said. I'm glad the shark bit me. And sometimes something will happen to you. Say, this is the worst thing that could happen. And then as time passes, suddenly you look back and you go, actually, that was... Kind of a good thing. Actually, the Lord used that to make a very needed change in my life. Of course, coming back to Joseph, there he is in prison, in irons, as iron is entering his soul. And ultimately, through God's direction, he interprets dreams and ends up in the palace of the king and interprets the king's dream. And next thing you know, it, he's running Egypt under the king very powerful man and his brothers who had sold him for the silver were brought before him not knowing it was Joseph. You know, he didn't look like a Hebrew anymore. His head would have been shaved and he would have dressed in the manner of the Egyptians. He would walk like an Egyptian for sure um, and all that. So they were looking at him, didn't even know who he was. And then he ultimately revealed, I am Joseph. And they probably thought, and we are dead. But they weren't dead because Joseph made that amazing statement in Genesis 50, 20 to his brothers. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. And he brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. You meant it against me, God meant it for good. That's what I mean when I say 
all things can work together for good. Again, we love that verse, Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good to those who what? Love God and are called according to his purpose. And that brings me to my next point, point three. God's ultimate purpose for us in trials and really in life is to conform us into the image of Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. God's ultimate purpose for us through trials and really in life is to conform us into the image of Jesus Christ and his usual method for this is heavenly pressure. Why? To produce a family likeness. Yes, we love Romans 8.28, but we forget that after that is Romans 8.29. And those two verses together give the big picture. Again, Romans 8.28, we know that all things work together for good to those that love God and are the called according to his purpose. Verse 29, for whom he foreknew, he also did predestine that they might be conformed into the image of his own dear son. People will stand around and argue endlessly about predestination and who is predestined and who is not and they'll miss the point of why God predestined or chose us. What does predestination mean? It means God determined it before you were alive. You were predestined, why? To be conformed to the image of his own dear son. God's long-term goal for you is to become like Jesus. So, there are things we go through in life and it's bad. And then through a turn of events, like in the case of Joseph, it can actually turn into something good. The bad thing can become a good thing, like the guy with the shark bite. But then there are things in life that are bad. They stay bad. And they're always bad. Am I right? They never are good. Tragedies? That wasn't good. Now, maybe good came out of it. But it never becomes a good thing. And by the way, God doesn't say a bad thing always will become a good thing. It says he'll cause all things to work together for good. But here's the bigger picture. Some of the things that God is doing in your life are not going to be discovered until we get to heaven. And you'll realize that all those things were designed to make you more like Jesus. So some benefits of trials we will see in this life and other benefits of trials will not be seen until the afterlife. Just know this, God is at work. It might be through irritating people. Oh, irritating people. Did you ever stop and think that you are maybe one of those irritating? No, not me. It's the other people, not me. Well, we're probably all irritating to someone, I'm sure. It might be an emotional low. It might even be a tragedy, like the loss of a loved one. But we must remember this. These pains are temporary. 2 Corinthians 4.17 says, Our present troubles are small, and they won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. I love that verse. So we will look a lot of times at, at the here and now, and we don't think about the by and by. But God's looking at the bigger picture. You know, just like a kid. You know, kid only thinks of the moment. I want this toy. I want to eat this candy. I want to eat this candy and have this toy simultaneously. And the parent looking out for the greater good of the child says, no, you can't have that candy before bed. No, you can't have that toy. And they're thinking of something that, that's better for you in general. And the kid doesn't understand it until the child gets older. So maybe you're in one of these situations right now. You're back up against a wall with no way to look but up. Good news, God is still in the miracle business. He's still in the miracle business. I love this statement from Bible commentator Warren Worsby. And I quote, When God permits his children to go through the furnace, he keeps an eye on the clock and a hand on the thermostat. If we rebel, he may have to reset the clock. But if we submit, he will not permit us to suffer one minute too long. Isn't that good? I should have just said that and you'd have thought I came up with it. But actually, that was from Warren Wiersbe, and it's so right. If we rebel, he may have to reset the clock. Here's the problem. Some people are being tested, retested, tested again, and retested because they don't learn the material. So stinking, learn it and move on. 
and graduate to the next grade. Don't stay in spiritual kindergarten forever. Point number four, suffering can bring glory to God. Suffering can bring glory to God. How so? Well, any fool can be happy when the sky is blue and the sun is shining and everything is going well, but when a storm is coming, it's a different matter. Back to Job again. Satan challenged God, who was bragging on Job, and said, you bless him, and that's why he follows you. So the Lord allowed the calamities. But what did Job do? When the bottom of life dropped out, he worshiped God, showing Satan was wrong. And all of God's confidence in Job was not misplaced at all. And then there are those times when God can be glorified through just intervening and doing a miracle. I mean, maybe you're sick and, and you go to the doctor and they say, uh, you have cancer and there's nothing we can do. And you might as well get your affairs in order uh, because you may only have a few months to live. And then you go to church and you say, I need prayer. And the Bible says if there's any sick among you, call for the elders of the church who will uh, lay hands on that person and pray for them and anoint them with oil. And the effectual fervent prayer of an evangelist will accomplish much, you know. And so you go and you get prayer. And then you go and you get rechecked and suddenly the tests reveal the cancer is gone and the doctors can't figure it out. What happened? A miracle. God still does things like that today. We hear stories like this all the time. He intervenes. He does the miracle. He provides that sum of money that is needed. He comes through in some amazing way. He still does it. So sometimes God is glorified by removing the problem and resolving the situation. How many of you have had what looked like an insurmountable problem that was overruled by God? He intervened. Okay, so that's most of you. That's fantastic. Thank God when that happens. But then there are times when God will be glorified, not by the removal of the problem, but by leaving it there and having you worship him just the same. And that's a powerful testimony. That's what happened to Paul and Silas, who were thrown into a prison for preaching the gospel. And the Bible says at midnight, they began to sing praises to God, and the other prisoners were listening. And by the way, that phrase listening means listening with pleasure. I don't think they'd ever heard singing in a hellhole like that before. But Paul and Silas were able to give God glory at midnight and and then, of course, you remember that they had been treated so badly by that Roman jailer who whipped them and had a hard heart. But then the earthquake came. A miracle happened. Uh, all the prisoners could have run free if they wanted to. And the jailer was about to kill himself because he knew if he lo lost his prisoners, he would be executed by Rome. And Paul said, don't harm yourself. We're all here. And that jailer said, sirs, tell me, what must I do to be saved? You see, their testimony won him over because they gave God the glory, not after the earthquake, but before. And that's the time to give God the glory. So let's say you're that person that gets the, the unfortunate diagnosis. You're the person that has the tragedy befall you. You're the person that hears the bad news. You say, well, I'll give God the glory when he fixes it. No, no, you give God the glory now. Right now you give him the glory. Because he's still in control. He's going to work it ultimately together for his glory and your good. He's going to make you more like Jesus. Again, coming back to Job, when he heard the, the horrible things that happened, the loss of his possessions, his livelihood, and worst of all, the loss of all of his children, we read, Job prayed and worshiped and said, Naked came I into this world, naked go I out. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And the Bible goes on to say, and all of this, Job did not blame God or charge him foolishly. So that's important. Paul and Silas gave glory to God before the earthquake, before the answer. Sometimes God will allow the hardship. Listen to this. God can be glorified even in disability. A disability can become an ability when placed in the hands of God a disadvantage can actually become an advantage. You say, I don't, I don't know what that means. Don't use these tricky words with me, preacher. What do you mean? 
Okay, let me illustrate. My friend Nick Vojacic, you know who I'm talking about? If you don't, Nick was born in Australia without arms and legs. He's limbless. And uh, he's one of the most joyful Christians I've ever met. And I'll tell you what, here's where his disability turns into an ability. They'll put him in front of a bunch of high school kids, uh, many of them struggling with their own uh, problems, some of them being bullied, some of them even feeling maybe life isn't worth living. And Nick Vojacic is literally, and I mean no disrespect when I say this, he has to be picked up and placed on a table because he can't get there on his own. And there he stands, and they look at this young man, and he talks about how good God is and how God has helped him. All of a sudden, you look at your problems with a new perspective. You think, man, if he can rejoice, why am I not rejoicing? And, and though it's very hard for Nick, and, and he still, this is the most difficult challenge imaginable, he has chosen to not waste his pain and to leverage this problem into a way to bring glory to God. And the Lord's opened up doors for Nick all around the world to bring hope and help and most of all to bring Jesus to so many people. So that's a disability being turned into an ability. That's a disadvantage being turned into an advantage. Another example is Johnny Erickson Tata. You've heard of her? Uh, Johnny is a, a wonderful lady who uh, many years ago, actually in 1967, she was a young teenager. She dove off a little uh, dock and had a spinal cord injury that paralyzed her from the neck down. And uh, this the worst thing that could happen to a young person. And, and yet Johnny, uh, despite the severe disability, has brought hope to millions of people. They made a movie about her life and she's written many books and but she still deals with pain. In fact, recently, if it wasn't hard enough uh, to be in her condition, she got breast cancer. And uh, she was interviewed uh, by a magazine. And in this magazine, she said these words. Uh, she said she was in a battle against principalities and powers and that want us to despair, she said. And her emotions take her dark, dark, dark grim paths. And she says, so I have to actively participate. And she takes as her theme, Hebrews 10, 38, where God says, my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Johnny says, I don't want to be one of those who shrink back. I don't want to tarnish his name. Wow. Now here's a lady who is a quadriplegic and has breast cancer. And she says, I don't want to bring shame to his name. I want to honor the Lord. I don't want to shrink back. And uh, thankfully they did surgery and the cancer was removed. But what a shining example she is. She said, I'm on this battlefield and my question is, how can I glorify God? Okay, so you've got your problems and, and I don't want to diminish what you're going through because you say, okay, my problems aren't that bad, but there's still problems, Greg. Okay. I'll give you that. Yeah, problem's a problem, a trial's a trial. Whatever it is, big, small, somewhere in the middle. Okay, but now here's the question. Can you somehow give glory to God through that? Can you find a way to remember that God is still in control of your life and he's gonna work it out for his glory and your good ultimately? Can you use it as an opportunity to proclaim Christ to others? Yes, sometimes he will remove the affliction and sometimes he'll be glorified in the affliction. Coming back to Job for the last time, you know, when his whole world fell apart, he didn't say, I understand it. He just said, blessed be the name of the Lord. He just called out to the Lord. And that's what we need to do as well. Number five, and lastly, trials and suffering can be used by God to prepare us for a special task. Trials, suffering, can be used by God to prepare us for a special task. God's getting you ready for something. Again, that was the case with Joseph. God was preparing him to be a great world leader. As he said, to save many people alive. God can use these experiences of life to transform us. You know, when, when you've gone through something and survived it, 
you can be a great comfort to someone else who is going through it. Now when the Lord called our son Christopher home to heaven, uh, I reached out immediately to people who had lost children. And I knew a few. One of those people was John Corson, pastor and a friend for years. And, and I just said, John, help me. And, you know, oh, I'm not some big pastor with all the answers. I'm a father who lost his son, and I'm in pain like any other father would be. And, you know, John was such a comfort. I think just to see someone that survives such a thing functioning is, brings a measure of hope, okay? So when you've gone through something, you say, why did God allow me to go through this? The answer may be, well, we don't know, but I know this. You're going to sure bring a lot of hope to somebody else that's going through it. Because when that crisis hits you, when that doctor says you have cancer, when, when the loved one dies and it looks like your world just ended, to have someone say, you're going to get through this because I've gone through the same thing and let me share with you what the Lord has shown me. So you have a message like nobody else has. So you don't ever want to waste your pain. God allowed it. Now God wants to use it. Over in 2 Corinthians 1, Paul says, He comforts us in all of our troubles. Listen to this. He comforts us in all of our troubles. Why? So we can comfort others. When they're troubled, we'll be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. We can be sure the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. See, you comfort with the comfort that you have been comforted with. So perhaps the hardships of today are preparing you for greater opportunities tomorrow. Warren Worsby, to quote him again, uh, quotes a professor of history who said, if Columbus had turned back, nobody would have blamed him, but nobody would have remembered him either. Worsby concludes, if you want to be memorable, sometimes you have to be miserable. <laughs> I like that. You know, yeah, you may be going through this hardship. Why did God allow it? Well, I can always answer that, nor can you. God's in control. You might say, man, I, I don't know, this stuff, this message is like so depressing. Like, why do you have to talk about things like this? Can't you tell us something that's, that's more positive? I actually think it's kind of positive to think that God can take the worst things and work through them. This is real life. You say, well, I could never have handled the things that Job had to face. In fact, I can't handle suffering at all. In fact, I don't do suffering. Well, then you're not going to do life. Or you're going to live in a state of basic denial. Listen, denial is not just a river in Egypt, okay? <laughs> to quote Stuart Smalley, and I don't want to explain that. But um, reality is, Hardship is going to come your way. It's, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Trials are going to come. Now some of you are young and you're saying, well, I haven't faced them yet. That's because you're young. But you will. And some of you are older and you say, I've faced quite a few already. In fact, I'm in one right now. Okay, here's what we need to remember so we don't get freaked out when we hear about hardship and the lives of others. God gives you what you need when you need it. God gives you what you need when you need it. Not necessarily before, listen, but never after. Not necessarily before, but never after. He will give you the strength. He will give you the words. He will give you the power to do what you need to do when you need to do it. Corrie Tin Boom. You ever heard of her? Amazing lady. If you've never read her book, go find it. The Hiding Place. Amazing story of the Tin Boom family, a Dutch family. Uh, living in Holland during World War II. The Nazis were, of course, persecuting the Jews. They were hunting them down, arresting them, putting them in boxcars and sending them to concentration camps to be executed. And uh, so this Ten Boom family, they're a bunch of strong Christians and, and they believe that God's people, the Jews, uh, should be cared for, looked out for. In fact, uh, Father Ten Boom, his name was Casper, said that these are God's chosen people. And they've touched the apple of God's eye. So they took their home that was above a watch shop in Harlem. That was a city there in Holland. And I've actually gone and visited this place. It still stands today. And up above, they built sort of false walls in front of other walls that created small little cubicles or rooms. Hence the name, The Hiding Place. They hid Jewish people in their home 
from the Nazis and did so very successfully for quite a long time, but then the Nazis figured it out and came and warned this Ten Boom family, if you don't stop hiding these Jews, we're gonna arrest you. And then the Ten Boom families would not have been arrested otherwise, but they refused to stop helping the Jewish folks. And so one day the Gestapo shows up, they arrest all of the Ten Booms and they send them to concentration camps. Casper uh, Ten Boom, the father was an elderly man, he died quickly. Uh, Corey and her sister Betsy, so you don't have to read the book, I'm telling you the whole story right now. I won't tell it all to you, but um, Corey and her sister Betsy were sent to a concentration camp known as Ravensbrück. And there they, they sought to honor the Lord and they started Bible studies and led many of those other uh, female prisoners to the Lord. And, and then sadly Betsy died in that concentration camp and through a clerical error, a Corey was released. It, it was a mistake, but it was really God's providence. And she was released from the camp and spent the rest of her life as a self-described tramp for the Lord, bringing hope to people. Well, anyway, she used to tell this story, and I quote from her book. When I was a little girl, I would go to my father and say, Daddy, I'm afraid that I'll never be strong enough to be a martyr for Jesus Christ. Tell me, said father, when you take a train trip to Amsterdam, when do I give you the money for the ticket? Three weeks before? No, Daddy, said Corey. You give me the money for the ticket just before we get on the train. That's right, my father said, Corey speaking now. And so it is with God's strength. Our Father in heaven knows when you will need the strength to be a martyr for Jesus Christ. He'll supply all that you need just in time, end quote. Now that doesn't mean we're all gonna be martyrs for Jesus, but what it means is this that whatever you're gonna face, God will give you what you need when you need it, so don't panic, it's organic. <laughs> that has nothing to do with what I'm saying. I just like it because it rhymes. And I wanna see if you're listening. So don't panic. God's in control. He's gonna work it out for his good. He'll give you what you need when you need it. Now, final thoughts. Everything I've said is for only a follower of Jesus. You know, if you're not a Christian, you're listening to this message, actually this doesn't really apply to you. Romans 8, 28 again, all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. For the man or woman who doesn't love God or doesn't believe in God or doesn't want God, all things are not working together for good. Let me take it a step further. All things are kind of working together for bad. Because not only is your own life gonna have troubles, every life does. You know, the rain falls on the just and the unjust, the Bible says, everyone is gonna have calamity, everyone is gonna face hardship, everyone's gonna lose loved ones. The Christian can hang on to God knowing that the Lord is in control and will accomplish his purposes, but the non-Christian, what are they gonna hang on to? There's nothing. There, there's no person that can fix it, there's, there's no way to resolve it, and that is why you need Jesus. Listen to this, sometimes God allows hardship in our life to wake us up to our spiritual need. The psalmist said, before I was afflicted I went astray, but now I have kept your word. And maybe something has happened to you recently, it has been like your wake up call, a close brush with death yourself, maybe someone close to you died or or maybe something dramatic happened, your wife or your husband walked out on you, or Starbucks closed before you got there, I don't know. <laughs> I'm joking about that, of course. But here's the thing. Whatever has happened, maybe it's got you to start looking up, saying, maybe I need God. Maybe I need to start thinking about my life spiritually. Uh, yeah, that's what you should be doing. You need to think about Him and how much He loves you and how you can run to him. Just, you know, when a little child falls and hurts himself, what do they do? They run to their parents. Let's get specific. They run to mommy. If daddy's around, they'll accept him. But they really want mommy, right? Uh, and mom takes that little one into her arms and hugs them and kisses them and reassures them and maybe kisses their hand or wherever they were hurt or whatever it was or their knee and tells them it'll be all right. Well, listen, we fall, we're hurting you can run into the arms of your father who's just ready to receive you. He will, he'll receive you. You say, well, what, 
What if I've made a mess of my life and all these things that are happening to me are because I've made wrong decisions? Would God still receive me? Yeah, he would. He would receive you. He said, let me help you now. First of all, let's get you right with me. First, he'll forgive you of your sin. And now he'll start changing you from the inside. And you can go back to what looks like a tangled mess that could never be resolved. And you watch what God will do. I don't know what state your life is in right now, but I know what the answer to your problems are. It's not an it, it's a who, it's Jesus Christ. You need to come to him. He'll throw his arms around you, he'll forgive you. But you must say, God, I'm sorry for my sin. You must turn from it. You must put your faith in him, in him alone, and he will help you. Jesus showed us how much he loved us when he went to the cross 2,000 years ago and died there in our place and spilled his own blood so we could have our sin forgiven and come into a right relationship with God. If you don't know God in a personal way, if Jesus is not living inside of you, if you don't have the assurance that you will go to heaven when you die, if you feel as though you're all alone and lifeless and Christ will come into your life tonight, just like that girl. She said, you know, I'm gonna go to church Sunday and commit my life to Jesus. No, you aren't. You're gonna do it right now. And that's what I'm saying to you. Well, you know, I'm coming back Sunday. Fine, come back as a new Christian. Let's get this solved right now. You can come to Christ right now. So we're gonna pray and I'm gonna give you an opportunity to ask Jesus Christ to come into your life if you need to do that. And there might be some that, well, you're a believer but you've been running from God and it's brought a lot of added drama into your life. It's brought a lot of problems you didn't have and you wouldn't have had otherwise, but you kind of brought this on yourself. You're reaping what you sow. Maybe you need to come back to the Lord. It's like old Jonah, you know, he was told to go preach to Nineveh. He said, no, <laughs> went the opposite direction and a storm came. And maybe you're running from God and a storm has come. But remember that the Lord was there for him even in the storm. He'll be there for you. So if you need to come to Christ or come back to him, here's an opportunity to do it as we close in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your love. Thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross in our place and then to rise again from the dead. Now, Lord Jesus, we pray that you will speak to hearts here. Help people know that are present, that are listening, that are watching, that there's forgiveness that there's a second chance in life, no matter what they've done wrong, that you will accept them and forgive them, help them to come to you. Right now we pray in Jesus' name.